Many of you know him is Dr. Ryan Stonehart. He's a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Alberta. And he's also the consulting psychiatrist for the multidisciplinary team at the Alberta Health Services and Bariatric Program. His primary of interest is expertise in consultation liaison psychiatry, which is the branch of psychiatry that specializes in the interface between medicine and psychiatry. And he is going to speak to us today about mood and food. So. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me out. You know, and it was interesting when I was hearing that. When I was in med school, I, kn I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I remember a couple years into med school, people were talking about, you know, would you be interested in this or would you be interested in that? And I started my psychiatry rotation and I said, that's the one thing that I've absolutely ruled out. You know, I'm sure I don't want to be a psychiatrist because that's not real medicine and it's, you know, you people don't make a change, it's not interesting, and by the end of my time on psychiatry, I actually realized that it was one of the few areas in medicine where we actually are able to spend time with people. And I felt like in so many other areas of medicine, all you were doing is you were being kind of a glorified lab result interpreter. You were ordering tests and interpreting them. And one of the things I really liked about psychiatry was that you're the diagnostic instrument, or you're the person whose job it is to figure out what's actually going on with the patient. And it's also taking this approach where you look not only at what's going on medically, but on you know, psychologically, thought patterns, and socially. And I didn't want to give up medicine, so I ended up working in consultation liaison psychiatry, where I work full-time on the medical and surgical units. So I see people who get admitted with physical health problems, and then also may have emotional problems. And that's how I ended up getting involved in the Weight Wise program. But one of the things I find really interesting about all of those things is probably the whole reason everyone's here today is really what you're doing is looking at the whole person and everything, everything that they bring to the table. And so that's going to be one of the common themes. When you talk about discussion points after, the one that I'd actually like to have you just think in the back of your head is, should someone who's depressed try to work on weight? You know, should you be trying to actively address your weight when you're depressed? So that, that's the thought that I want to leave in, in the back of your head and talk about things. One of the things that was really interesting to me when I started working in the area of obesity, I came home and my family said, wait, you know, like, what was it like working in the obesity clinic? And I was like, well, it's kind of like all the other patients that I see. And part of that, I think, is because most of the population is overweight or obese. So there, there were some differences. One of the things that I found, though, is that most of the people that I was talking to who came to work on weight had actually never been diagnosed in the past or actually hadn't tried to work on weight, and that made me really or work on their mood or anxiety. And I think it's because we tend to think that people who are overweight, when they're depressed or when they're anxious, well, of course they are. You know, so we don't even try. And it's actually this bias against diagnosing or treating mood or anxiety problems in people who are overweight. We just kind of ignore that. And so it's actually been a very rewarding area because when you try to treat people, they actually do very well. I mean, we all know that the longer you the longer someone goes with depression or anxiety that's you know not treated or ineffectively treated, the harder it is to get them well. So usually, as a psychiatrist, I'm pretty useless. You know, by the time someone's gone through their family doctor and has tried multiple things, <coughs> and you go to treat their depression, I'm not very effective because they're really treatment resistant. But when I work at the bariatric clinic, I can actually be a pretty good psychiatrist most of the time because no one's even tried. And so one of the things to keep in the back of your head is really look for depression and anxiety and encourage people to get treatment because this is a population where treating that, they can actually have very good outcomes. <coughs> You've probably seen these slides from Dr. Sharma before. You know, I think in medicine in general, we focus so much on the medical complications of obesity, and usually when people end up coming in for treatment, they're coming in because of hypertension, or diabetes, or dyslipidemia, or liver disease, or pulmonary disease, and we spend all our time trying to treat that rather ineffectively without treating the root cause. You know, 
when you look at something like edema being positive fluid balance, you know, and we, we don't say to patients, okay, we really want you to drink less and pee more. We try to figure out what's actually going on behind to actually cause that. And so many people tend to simplify weight loss down to kind of eat less and exercise more without really looking at the root cause. And that's actually the same thing with depression. People tend to lump all depression or all anxiety together. It's like, oh, you're depressed, you need an antidepressant. You know, or, oh, you're anxious, you know, just worry less. And so it's similar to saying drink less and pee more, but we're actually saying let's look at the underlying cause. So whether we're doing that for obesity or whether we're doing that for depression, we really need to take a very integrated kind of biological, psychological, and social approach to treating both of those. And so you've been working on the skills for addressing obesity, and those are the same skills to look at from a mood perspective. And when you talk about all the time people spend mopping up the floor of kind of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and sleep apnea, we know that obesity is the cause. So if we're not turning off the tap, we're not going to be very successful. And when you look at what happens when you turn off the tap, everyone's seen bariatric surgery and the effects on you know, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, sleep apnea, you know, cured in 60%, 86% of people. So we know that we can have much better outcomes when we're treating obesity with all of the other things that we're dealing with in medicine. But we have to remember that obesity isn't the only cause. You know, we actually talk about obesity. You know, there's so many different ways that you can end up overweight that if you try to have the same approach for every patient, you're not going to be very successful. I would say the same thing for depression. We tend to equate sadness and major depression as being the same thing. So, and, and I find particularly now that antidepressants are so socially accepted, that what we find is people come in, they're crying and they're sad, so we say, you're depressed. Oh, you have major depression, you need to go on an antidepressant. And that actually doesn't work for a lot of the people that we're treating depression for. I think everyone in the room would know someone who's been on an antidepressant that they haven't worked for, or can think of you know, an experience where someone just goes in and is sad and is thrown on an antidepressant. And, and I think that's kind of taking the same simplistic approach towards mood as it is to all of the other areas. Because when you think of depressed mood, there's many things that can cause depressed mood. You know, that can actually be, you know, here's the framework that we talk about for obesity. You know, it's calories in, calories out. So we're looking at things like diet, metabolism, and activity, and you know how mood can interact. There's actually a similar approach when we come to look at depression. If you look at some of the overlaps between obesity and mood disorders, you know, it can actually affect things in, uh, in basically almost every area. So if you look at calories in on the inside, we know there's many factors that people, why people eat. Most of the people that you're dealing with aren't eating because they're hungry. You know, if you look at the whole emotional eating side of things, I, everyone who comes to see us usually is very motivated to lose weight. And they usually come in and they say something to the effect, you know, I know what to do, I know what to do, and I know what I'm supposed to do, and I just can't do it. And that's because you know, they're often eating for other reasons. You know, we can eat, we eat because it makes us feel better. And there's some actual interesting science behind that. I actually think that when you're dealing with someone who's overweight and their weight isn't, you know, they're not dropping or their weight's staying the same or their weight's going up, I think their body's finding a balance that works for them. You know, and, and we tend not to think of, we tend not to think of that, but. I, the longer I've been in psychiatry, I realize that every system kind of levels out for a reason. And this whole systems approach to looking at things, our bodies aren't stupid and our brains aren't stupid. We do what works for us. So if you've got someone who's overweight and emotionally eating, 
it's probably working for them. So they've actually shown that a lot of foods help to regulate emotions. I mean, we've all talked to patients who say, when I overeat, I feel better. You know, or I'm having a bad day, I'm angry, I have a fight, I feel lonely, I feel bored. You know, I grab a bag of chips, I eat a chocolate bar, you know, I go out for junk food, I stop at Wendy's on the way home from work. And in the moment, it actually works. So really what they're doing is they're choosing a pretty effective anti-anxiety medication or antidepressant that works in the moment but has the side effect of weight gain. And so I think just like if I was talking to someone with a substance use problem, when I'm talking to people about the link between food and mood, I think it's actually really helpful to acknowledge that in some ways what they're doing is working for them. You know, invalidate that. Because people wouldn't be doing it if it didn't work. We all do things that don't work once in a while, but you know that you don't continue to do something unless you're getting something out of it. So actually validating that, saying, okay, in the moment, you know, yeah, if you look at things like junk food, those are actually hardwired, kind of these high fat, high fat junk food, high calorie laden foods, are actually hardwired to give us pleasure. You know, and the brain does that so that you can scavenge and collect food and prepare for a time ahead. But you know, they're using that very old system in their brain to regulate their emotions. So basically say, yeah, okay, that works. And I think a lot of patients are relieved if you can validate that they're actually doing something that works for them on some level, but here's the things that are bothering you. Then it affects self, you know, later on it affects self-esteem, it affects physical well-being, it affects energy levels, um, you know, affects your physical health. Everyone knows they don't want to be overweight or that they would potentially feel happier. But I think just the start is to acknowledge that you're doing something that the moment works but has the <coughs> side effect of weight gain. So let's talk about more effective strategies for dealing with this. And you all know that whole kind of immediate reward versus long-term risk. Yeah, it, it balances out. So kind of saying to people, okay, if your weight isn't changing and you're really stuck, maybe where you're at right now is working for you. So let's look at what we can do in this area to change why you're eating. You know, whether that's treating depression, whether it's treating anxiety, doing some work on emotional eating and the links between food can actually be really helpful. If you look at the calories outside of things, we know also that metabolism and activity can be affected by both depression or anxiety as well as our medications. If you look at activity levels, if you're depressed, you're not going to be going out and being super active. If, you're, if you have social anxiety, or a lot of Patients who are overweight don't have social anxiety per se, but they're, they're embarrassed to be out in social situations. They're embarrassed to go out to the gym, to exercise, to even walk or be out. So it is going to affect some of their activity levels. When you look at metabolism, there's actually not a lot of factors that we can change related to metabolism. You can't change your age, can't change your gender, genetics. Hormones often you can't change. You can increase muscle mass, but really with medications, one of the things I want to talk about today is many of our psychotropic medications, such as antidepressants or mood stabilizers, actually adversely affect metabolism. So, so that's another consideration in this whole balance. So as you can see, it's it's a fairly complex system, and I think having the broadest possible approach with everyone that we're dealing with really helps us to say, okay, why are you eating? You know, what are the, what's affecting your metabolism? What's affecting your activity? And where do we go from there? So, you know, we talked about all of these things with altered metabolism, with medications, many different ways that intake can be impacted from a mental health perspective. There's eating disorders, or disordered eating I actually think is actually more helpful because if you look at the diagnostic criteria for eating disorders, it's quite rare that we would see people that would meet the full criteria per se. Um, ADHD is another topic. 
mood and anxiety, history of abuse. Um, many patients <coughs> with weight will have a history of, with weight issues, have a history of childhood sexual abuse. And that's another example where weight can actually be quite protective. We've seen a number of people in the clinic who've lost weight who then become very vulnerable or distressed because the weight is protective. It helps them to feel safe. People don't, people don't pay attention to them. It was actually quite sad that if you're overweight, you can be kind of somewhat invisible in society. You become this non-entity. And people, as they lose weight, sometimes can experience a lot of distress. That's not a reason to not lose weight, but it's something to be mindful of or be aware of as you're going along the journey. So sometimes, just going back, you know, we've talked about how mental health can actually cause weight gain. It can also be a barrier to obesity management. You know, so sometimes the mental health side will have nothing to do with the reason that they're overweight. But if you're depressed, for example, and you have impaired concentration, low mood, poor organizational skills, poor motivation, poor energy, you're actually setting someone up for failure if you're trying to really get them to manage significant amounts of change. And often when I'm seeing someone as a psychiatrist in the clinic, if I see someone who's very profoundly depressed, I may say to them, okay, I actually think it's right now, it's worsening your mood to actively work on weight. You know, here you're in a stage where you can't focus, you can't concentrate, you feel negative about everything, and if you're trying to really manage change in a way that's quite difficult, you're actually setting yourself up for failure. And usually when I'm saying that in the bariatric clinic, that's part of saying, let's transition you, you know, back to community resources. And a lot of people feel that, you know, used to feel that that was very devastating, and I actually try to do a lot of work to say, no, actually, this is the first step. You know, your first step of working on weight is to actually get your mood and anxiety addressed. You know, and relate that to think of all the things you've tried that have failed. You know, why has that failed? This is maybe the missing piece. You know, you, you've tried every diet, you've tried all these lifestyle strategies, and things haven't worked in someone who's obviously intelligent and very capable. So let's look at the mental health piece. And that's actually not stopping work on weight. That's actually kind of starting on the right steps. You're building the proper foundation so every other step can build upon that. Because sometimes you will find yourself faced with people where you say, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute, let's put, you know, the, let's put the actual kind of more you know, working on diet or lifestyle change, let's put that aside and work on weight or work on mood right now. But that's actually working on weight. Because if we address your mood, you're actually going to be have the foundation to build upon. One of the things that's been really interesting in my area of work where I work with people who have medical comorbidities is there's a clear link actually between depressive disorders and mood disorders. So if you look at diabetes and obesity, they're twice as prevalent in patients with mood disorders than control populations. <clears throat> They've actually shown some of, there's some shared metabolic disturbances between them. You know, depression isn't just sadness. You know, when they say it's all in your head, it actually isn't all in your head. Um, there's a lot of interesting physical changes with depression. With Depression, they've actually shown shrinkage in your brain in your hippocampus. So that's the part of your brain that relates to memory. We've all seen patients who are depressed who say, like, my, my brain is just not working. Well, they've actually shown shrinkage or lack of kind of neuron regeneration in the hippocampus. So, yeah, it's all in your head, but it's actually causing something physiological. When you're depressed or sad, you, re you release the circulating catecholamines, you release stress hormones. I mean, we all know that kind of intrinsically you feel differently when you're stressed. When you're releasing those chemical markers, there's a lot of clear abnormalities in mood disorders. They've actually shown with blood sugars, you know, when you're depressed, your blood sugars are worse and vice versa. So there's kind of this bi-directional link. So we tend to think of depression as being all in your head, 
But depression really is a biochemical activity in your body, even if it's just caused by stress. So even if you don't have a chemical depression per se, if you're under significant or undue stress for a long time, you're actually changing your metabolism in your body in a way that mimics a lot of the changes that we see with weight gain or depression. So when you look at uh, on the general medical units, one of the things that's interesting, working in the hospital setting, so I see people just on the medical and surgical units, I don't actually work on the psychiatry unit. And when I first started, I worked at the ALEC for 10 years, and I first started working at the ALEC, and I, you know how they have those four bedrooms, and you know, it was numbered one, two, three, four? Well, I got mixed up one day, and I got asked <laughs> to see a patient, and I went to the wrong bed on cardiology, and I sat down, and I did an interview with the patient who was, I'd been asked to see someone who was depressed and suicidal, and the person that I saw was depressed and suicidal, and it wasn't until like the end of the interview I actually realized I'd seen the wrong patient in the room. But I think it speaks to the fact that when you've got medical illnesses, there is a higher rate of depression. So if you look at coronary artery disease, HIV, AIDS, Parkinson, epilepsy, different cancers, the highest number is actually for people who are overweight or obese. You know, 40 to 70 percent of people who are overweight or, or obese have depression. So one of the things that's actually quite challenging in my job is, say you see someone who's just had a stroke or just been diagnosed, you know, has had a major MI that had been perfectly fine. So you go in and see them and, yeah, their mood is low and they're tired and they have no energy and they're not sleeping and they have impaired concentration. One of the things that's hard is picking out what is actually from the burden of the medical illness versus a true major depression. You know, and because we know that there's a higher rate of depressive symptoms, just obviously if you've got those illnesses. But when you look at that clear difference between these major things, you know, like having a stroke or having a heart attack, and then the marked increase of depression in people who are overweight and obese, that indicates that there's a real clear link between those, above and beyond just having a medical illness or the burden of what's going on. One of the things that's also really interesting to me is if you were to look at people who are overweight or obese, so this is psychiatric diagnoses in patients seeking obesity treatment, so if you look at people who are obese in the community versus people who come in for treatment, whether you're looking at mood disorders, anxiety, or substance abuse, there's a big difference between someone who's obese in the community and isn't coming and seeking help, and people who are actually coming to seek help. So that's interesting. You know, so why is there, why are you two times more likely to be depressed if you're coming in to seek help for your obesity compared to you're just obese in the community and happy. So maybe it's the depression and anxiety that makes them want to get treatment. You know, they're so unhappy with everything going on that they actually want to change things. So there has been a link between obesity and increased risk of depression. If you look at the people where this has been shown to be the clearest, there's a stronger association for women so amongst, amongst depressed women and obese women, there's a higher link than with men. So we don't know why that is. And there's higher rates of depression in people seeking obesity treatment than obese people in the community. Could, could that be associated with the fact that typically women will ask for help more than men will? Well, women are way more likely first to ask for help, you know, with, both for depression and obesity. One of the things that's interesting between men and women, I also find often in presentation of depression, is when you look at diagnosing depression, and I alluded to that earlier, that people overdiagnose depression in people who are just sad. So if you look at the core symptoms of depression, it's either depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure. So being sad isn't necessary or sufficient to make a diagnosis of depression. So if you're just sad, you don't necessarily have major depression. Does that make sense? If you don't have the associated you know, changes in appetite, sleep, energy, concentration, and all of those things, 
you can actually have depression without being sad. Which I think a lot of people forget about, you know, because we just link those terms depression and major depression with sadness. So if you have lost interest or pleasure in what's going on in your life and have all of the other associated symptoms, you have a major depression. So we miss that. So I think we overdiagnose depression in people who come and are just sad. Like, oh, you're sad, here's an antidepressant. Guess what, it doesn't work. Well, maybe they're sad because they're unhappy in their relationship. Maybe they're sad because of significant life stressors. Maybe they're sad because of negative thought patterns or their spouse is cheating. Maybe this is a normal sadness. So we end up throwing people on antidepressants that shouldn't be on an antidepressant or they don't work. But I think the opposite side of that is we actually miss a significant number of people who are depressed because they're not sad. You know, they just come in and they're blah. You know, I have no get up and go. I, nothing makes me happy anymore. Or I just, I'm not interested in things. So, and, I, and, and that relates to men. You know, so I think that we do miss diagnosis, diagnosing depression in our men. Or, or they may not, or they may culturally not identify with sadness, or it may be shameful to admit being sad, but they'll have all of the symptoms and predominantly loss of interest or pleasure. So just flag that in the back of your head when you're meeting with people that, you know, if you're thinking, they kind of look <coughs> depressed, but they're not. <laughs> but they're not sad, they could actually be depressed. So when you look at some of the directional things, does obesity lead <coughs> to depression? And the, the answer is yes. So if you're obese, you're more likely to develop depression as time goes on than if you were not obese. You know? And there's a little bit of a link the other way as well. You're one and a half times more likely to end up with depression at follow-up than if you were not obese. Why is that? You know, I think some of that could be some of that could be just the physical symptoms of obesity, you know, with low energy, being tired, feeling negative about yourself, the added stress that it brings on. Often I'll see people who come in and I'll say, okay, you're depressed, and I think we need to treat your depression, you know, whether that's with therapy or medications, and they'll be like, no, I just need to lose weight and I'll be happy. Does that work? Sometimes. Not all the time. Some patients can have improved mood with weight loss, you know, and, and it makes sense. You've got less pain, fewer physical symptoms, improved self-esteem. So losing weight may, may help your mood. What we find more often is that a real pre-existing mood disorder often will persist with weight loss. So just keeping that in mind. So going back to when you see someone who's depressed, I think trying to look at things from a whole biological, psychological, and social perspective, just like we do with obesity, is actually really helpful. So by biological, I would mean chemical changes. And there are clear chemical changes with depression. Now, how do you explain that to a patient? Because usually when we're seeing someone, there's a stressor that is has brought things on. The, the patients that I think tend to have a more biological component to their mood, or the ones that actually respond better to antidepressants, would be people who have kind of a clear onset of depression. You know, you're fine, and then you're suddenly depressed. Those, tend, those people tend to respond better to antidepressants than people who've been dysphoric or low mood for a long time, where there's no clear on and off. True major depression is actually episodic. So if you see someone who's been depressed their whole life, I may wonder more about kind of psychological or social factors that are contributing to depression. Um, family history of depression, you know, past history of depression, responding to treatment, those would be things that would suggest a more kind of biological or inherited component of depression. Psychological factors are actually very important. So if you, and those would be things like kind of cognitive distortions, if you tend to anticipate the negative, if you tend to personalize everything, you know, it's my fault, if you tend to read into things. The whole cognitive side of depression is really interesting. And I think one of the, one of the things we know is that your automatic thoughts can really affect your mood. 
So, say for example, I say for example, I was not here this morning, <laughs> or didn't show up. You know, Joey could be sitting there and saying, you know, what's going on? And she could have many automatic thoughts about what potentially could happen, or reasons for it. One could be he got in a car accident. You know, and so then the natural response would be to be worried or anxious. Could think, well, he really didn't want to come here anyway because he doesn't like us, you know, or maybe I ticked him off, you know, and it, you could personalize it or take, you know, this is about me, you know, it was, was that email, he didn't like the tone of that email, or it could be, you know, wow, that's really rude and ignorant, and then you could be angry or upset, and, or could think, okay, we talked yesterday and we confirmed everything, you know, the roads are snowy, I guess he'll get here, he might be late, obviously something came up, let's just wait and see what happens. So the same situation can happen, and the way you think about it really is going to affect your emotions and behaviors, and they're all potentially valid, but people who are depressed always go to the negative way more often, so sometimes even identifying that or changing thinking patterns or interpersonal relationships. And there's no point trying to fix depression without looking at social things in parallel. If you don't have any money, if you're under a lot of stress, you can't afford medications or treatment or childcare issues preventing you. And so, so, so it's interesting, you probably see a lot of parallels between the work you do with weight and what we do for treating depression. So, who's had patients who have complained of weight gain with antidepressants? <laughs> All of us. So one of the things that was really interesting, when antidepressants, the newer antidepressants, when Prozac first came out, they were, they're like, wow, here's this brand new antidepressant that's really exciting and it's so much better than the tricyclics and all of these things. And when they do studies for depression, they'll do eight week studies. And they were, they were really excited. They were going to sell Prozac as an antidepressant and they were going to sell it as a weight loss drug because everyone in their eight week trials lost weight. So they're like, wow, antidepressant makes you move better and you lose weight. Well, it's because they were nauseated for the first four weeks, you know? So you know the GI upset with antidepressants. So everyone lost weight because they were puking for the first few days because they were using really high doses of Prozac. So we've learned over time that antidepressants can cause weight gain. When you see someone who's gained weight on an antidepressant, here's a few factors or things to look at. So it's not necessarily always medication related. So one, it can actually be an improvement in patients who lost weight secondary to depression. If you look at the symptoms of depression, you know, loss of interest in food or changes in appetite can actually be a sign of depression. You know, sometimes I'll see patients with very profound depression where they've lost significant amounts of weight in a short period of time. So just because someone gains weight doesn't mean it's a bad thing. They may be going back to where they are. Um, some people overeat when they're depressed. In fact, a lot of the people that we would see actually overeat as a symptom of their depression. So there's, there's the people who kind of get agitated and don't sleep and you know, have insomnia and don't eat when they're depressed. And then there's what they used to call the atypical depressions where you overeat and sleep a lot. In my world, those are the more typical depressions that I see when they're tired all the time and actually overeat. So if you've got someone who's still gaining weight, maybe that's a symptom of their depression that's still residual. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it could be getting better from something that was bad. It could be a symptom of depression that's still there. Or it could be a side effect. So. When you look at which patients I would attribute weight gain to their medications, if there's been significant gain early on when they're on the medication, so taking a bit of history around them, or the gain continues despite remission of their depression. There is wide variety in weight gain with antidepressants. So I think rather than spending a lot of time on this, just to recognize the of the SSRIs, Paxil's probably the worst. You know, mirtazapine or Remeron is a significant weight gain. The tricyclics, you know, Wellbutrin actually causes statistically significant a little bit of weight loss. 
there was a bit of a time where it was in vogue to go on some well trim to see if you could lose weight. Well, your weight loss over a year is about like one to two kilos. Uh, when so sometimes I say to patients, that's like a bowel movement and going to, you know, like, it's, it's not a reason to take well uterine for <laughs> bowel movement and emptying your bladder, you know, and there's a kilo. <laughs> you know, like it's not a reason to take well uterine. But I think it's good to be mindful about which medications patients are on. Does that mean if you've got a patient who's doing well on Paxil or doing well on Remoron, they should come off it? Not necessarily, you know, especially if that's a medication that's worked really well for them. You know, the benefits on mood, or if they don't give a clear history of this medication really made me gain weight, then that would be a reason to not change things. Just briefly, the MAOIs we don't use very often. You probably don't see them at all. Tricyclics, things like amitriptyline, Elevil, people are often on for pain or fibromyalgia, but you have to remember, even if it's not been used as an antidepressant, that can be a significant cause of weight gain. I thought the other one's dose dependent. It is dose dependent, so at higher doses, it's more of an issue. So the, these numbers of like one and a half to three pounds per month in the first year would be at the antidepressant dose, not the fibromyalgia or migraine dose. <coughs> it's something to keep in mind. As I mentioned with the SSRIs, they initially thought they were weight neutral or associated with weight loss, but long term, there may be an increase in weight, with Paxil being the outlier among, amongst them. Of the SNRIs, like venlafaxine or Effexor, desvenlafaxine or Prestige, Deloxetine or Cymbalta, the studies have shown that they're relatively weight neutral. That being said, in my clinical experience, I have found that there's patients who will gain significant weight or lose significant weight. So you know, if it all balances out in the studies, it doesn't mean that with certain patients, you know, that that's not a potential cause or something to look at. With mirtazapine or Remeron, it's a sedating antihistamine, and we know the antihistamines cause a significant amount of weight gain. Wellbutrin, there's slight weight loss overall. So I would take it back to, if in a simplistic view, serotonin, medications that target serotonin can kind of go either way. And, you know, maybe fine for most patients, but just kind of keep an eye on it, things. The noradrenergic medications, like the SNRI, if you think of the role of noradrenaline, it's energy, motivation, cognitive function, makes sense. They may be better from a weight perspective. <coughs> For patients. Ultimately though you're going to treat the symptoms you know, that someone has. So okay, I think that's that's it for the formal presentation. Wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions, but I think in, in summary when you when you look at the link between mood and food, if there are a few key take-home points, remember that when people are eating or overeating related to mood. They could, they could actually be treating their own depression or anxiety. And so it's something to, to actually be mindful of the link between the two. And I think the other is really looking at addressing mood and anxiety issues as a foundation on which you can build everything else. Sometimes we're building that foundation in parallel. Like, okay, we're going to continue to work on weight while we try to optimize things from a mood perspective. Sometimes it can mean setting aside one or the other, you know, to work on things. And I generally suggest addressing mood, mood and anxiety issues first. Any questions or comments? One of the thoughts that I had that you had shared earlier that patients who seek treatment might have more depression than people in the community. And one of the things that I thought of working as a dietitian is that when they come in and we start working on removing some of the food that they might be using as self-medicating, 
you, would you get a change then in some of the symptoms? So if somebody is using mm -hmm. chocolate chip cookies to make them feel better, and we work and with them to take out those chocolate chip cookies, that could make get worse. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, it, <laughs> so, so sometimes when we're when we're making dietary interventions and we're taking away food from people, we're actually taking away a uh, coping mechanism. And so you can actually find that people get very distressed. Sometimes people may move to alcohol or they may move, you know, and we find that, say, post-operatively with some of our patients who, say, have a lap band or any, you know, a procedure where there's restriction and say they've been regulating their emotions with binge eating or, you know, emotionally eating or overeating. And you take that away. People can actually get quite distressed if they haven't if they haven't worked on effective coping strategies. And you know, often you'll get people who say, you know, well, I need to have bariatric surgery because nothing else has worked for me. And you know, we say, well, okay, if you haven't figured out <laughs> these basic these basic steps and how how you can live your life without using food to regulate your emotions, you're actually setting yourself up for you know, worsening of mood, and we actually we actually clearly see that. And you, know, you take away, you know, I've stopped binge eating, but my mood's actually worse. Yeah. So, any thoughts on someone who's depressed? Should they work on weight? So one thing that strikes me, this is very interesting, and I enjoyed it very much. Um, one of the things that strikes me is spectrum. Mm -hmm. So um, the population that we see in ambulatory care, primary care, is different population. And there's this continuum, and a lot of people have written about this continuum between distress and depression. And it doesn't change the fact that the patient is still suffering. Uh, and so, you're trying to do things to help. And we're lucky because we work as an interdisciplinary team, so we actually have resources that we can actually leverage to try to offer patients options to get the help that they need. But one of the things I wonder about is, um, you know, we talk a lot about SMART goals and kind of going where the patient is. And, you know, is it necessarily so bad if, if what they're doing to work on the, on the weight is, is saying, okay, well, I want to try to stay weight neutral while I'm working on this. So I want to make some SMART goals, which, I mean, what constitutes working on weight, I guess, is my question. That's the perfect answer. The, the perfect answer, because you know it already, is that just because you're depressed doesn't mean you can't yeah. do a bit of work on weight, but it's all about spectrum and intensity. Because, you know, I, depression isn't on or off. You know, it's not like you're depressed or not depressed. There's how much does it impact. So I think that's the perfect answer, is really looking at where is the person with respect to function, <laughs> and what are they able to do practically. You know, so even if someone's horribly depressed, doesn't mean you don't want to do a little, you know, that doesn't mean that we do nothing and abandon things, you know, especially, especially when you're working in the primary care setting that it would be very appropriate to say, okay, maybe your goal is to not gain weight or maybe your goal is to do a bit less of this. You know, in a way that's actually, you know, like you said, a smart goal. So if they can, as long as your goals are realistic, you know, if, if you've got someone who's severely depressed and you're wanting them to attend multiple appointments and make significant changes and keep detailed food records and, you know, restrict, that's not one. That's going to be setting them up for failure. So you can, you can work on things in parallel and it's just balancing things out, you know, looking at what they have the capacity to do. It, it's interesting because kind of a you know, light bulb has gone off for me because I've always maintained as a behavioral health consultant here at the PCM and the mental health team is that I don't see people for weight issues because I'm always prioritizing the, the mood or the anxiety disorder. But now I think, you know, my perspective has shifted from sort of primary and secondary goals because when I'm replacing those behaviors, if they are using food to mm -hmm. cope, and I'm replacing them with more mouth, more adaptive coping mechanisms, the secondary, you know, gain mm -hmm. is that they're actually starting to lose weight. Because yeah. if they're not reaching for the chocolate chip cookies, but they're doing some cognitive restructuring or something like that, 
it's the secondary goal. So that's been a real aha moment for me. Yeah. And, and it's interesting how that works. Like a lot of a lot of patients, when you treat their depression or you treat their underlying psychiatric illness, you know, whether it's through social changes, psychological changes, support, medications, the weight will come down. You know, and I've seen that in my in my practice all the time that treating mood is going to help with weight, and you know, it, it's balancing everything. Sometimes it's it's what you make explicit and not explicit. You know, but if they came to you and they're depressed and weight is one of the things that they work on, you can actually frame working on their mood and anxiety as part of addressing weight. Yeah, and it's interesting because so often I think back with so many patients who have come in, you know, a couple of months later or whatever, and I go, you're looking fantastic. You know, and they're like, yeah, I actually lost, you know, 50 pounds, mm -hmm. or whatever, but that wasn't the primary focus. Mm -hmm. The focus was on the mood and anxiety, so. Yeah, there was yeah. a patient I saw last yesterday afternoon who had has significant weight issues and was going to was on well you know different programs you know going to a group several times a week and all of these things and continuing to gain weight and now that they've addressed their depression my weight's going down about two pounds you know every you know, a pound a week, my weight's going down a pound a week, and I, I don't know what this is. I'm like, mm -hmm, your mood's better. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things that you found impossible to do and you were failing at, it's because, you know, and there were some things we did. We changed the medications to make them more weight neutral. We, you know, addressed ther therapeutic issues, family dynamics, and all of those things. And then the weights, without someone who's gone from spending every waking hour focusing on weight is now losing weight in a way that they never did when they were on a very restrictive diet because they were binging every night and they were you know getting into all of these behavioral difficulties so. well thank you very much for having me out and I appreciate you thank you. Thank you.